Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, ensconced in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you at the Yacht Club and in our beautiful grill room just as soon as it's safe for everybody to come back into, you know, uh, proximity with each other. In the meantime, we're continuing our series by visiting with people who are not even in the country in some cases, and that will be the case today. Our guests today include staff commodore, a bocce champion, former president of the California Bar, and generally pretty good guy, uh, Terry Anderlini. His companion on this particular trip was Dr. Paul Heineken. Paul, as we all know, is also a staff commodore, a great sailor, a very thoughtful ambassador for our club, and the sire of two world champions in kiteboarding. Paul Heineken is a novice mountaineer like yours truly, uh, but he already uh, bit the bullet and went with Terry, put his life in Terry's hands and went to the top of Mount Shasta. So we're going to hear from Paul Heineken as well. And as a special guest, we have a genuine climber. And by genuine climber, I mean she is the current record holder on the ascent of Mount Shasta. She's talking to us from the Dominican Republic, and she has, in fact, summited the great mounts of the world, including Everest itself. She is the sixth U.S. female to ever summit Everest, and she'll talk to us all about uh, Everest and genuine climbing, not just the kind of stuff that our good buddy Terry encourages uh, laymen like, like myself uh, to do. So she's a genuine climber and a, and a very, very accomplished uh, sports coach and uh, personal trainer and generally very talented person. She's speaking to us from the Dominican Republic. So Lori Bagley, very nice to have you joining us. Um, and so now um, we're gonna go to the uh, presentation that Terry and Paul have put together and tell us the story. Um, Terry Anderlini, what on earth caused you to buy a house up on Mount Shasta and uh, start taking your buddies <coughs> beautiful peak. Well, just looking at that fantastic mountain inspires you to see if you can get to the top of it. So uh, the awesome power of nature and the awesome appearance of this spectacular mountain uh, got me to think I should try to get to the top one day. And then talking to the locals, uh, I was encouraged that even a guy like me uh, at 63 years old or something like that uh, could make it to the top. So I signed Wait, up with a guy. Is that what you're telling? You're confessing you once were 63? I, what, I once was 63, yes, once. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, I decided to do some climbing at a later age of my life. I'd done some, of course, trail climbing and trail stuff, but nothing like climbing a mountain like Shasta. So, um, encouraged by the locals and the guides up there, I decided to try to get to the top one day, and I was given the information on how to train and this and that. And on my first adventure up there, I didn't make it. <laughs> I failed. I stopped at the Red Banks, and that was the end of my story. And then I got back, came back the next year, understanding what I had to do to get to the top. And that's when the first time I got to the top. But the real experience here is the awesomeness of power and power of nature. You really put yourself uh, in the hands of nature when you climb Mount Shasta, as you do on a sailboat when you sail out in the ocean. I was thinking that ocean sailing uh, is quite uh, similar in terms of connecting with nature. Uh, and this is just another way of connecting with nature at a high altitude. And it gives you a feeling of uh, how ins <laughs> insignificant we are in the scheme of things on this planet. I just wanted to show a slide of our, uh, the fearless leader here, uh, maybe closer to his 63rd birthday when he was up uh, going up the mountain. Yeah. I'm, I'm that, waiting for uh, my next uh, command to uh, move the slideshow along. Yeah, that's me probably uh, two thirds of the way up there. And this is the kind of terrain you look at uh, when you get past the tree line. You know, it's sort of like walking around the moon, uh, which is another awesome feeling about going up there. Uh, us uh, land lovers don't really understand the environment of high altitude as Lori does. Uh, going even further, twice as high as we go when she goes to Everest at 29,000 feet. But uh, this gives the uh, beginning climbers the idea of how challenging it is to climb a big mountain. Shasta is like an entry-level mountain 
Lori knows that the real stuff uh, starts at 14,000 feet and goes from there. And just a comment too, Terry, I feel like Shasta is a great introduction to mountaineering because it's hard, it's not easy, and it's not a trail, it's a route. So I, I find that it's, um, it's commendable. Anyone that has an opportunity to climb, no matter how high they get, they're gonna get that climbing ex exposure. Yeah, this gives you the fever, really, to climb mountains. <laughs> and it also gives you the idea that you better not go any further if you're not ready to go past 14,000 yeah. feet. Because yeah. there is danger. When you climb 14,000 feet, you better have uh, your act together and know what you're doing, because you can get hurt up there, too, even though it's 14 feet. I want to add one, one piece to that, and that's that Janet and I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro uh, back in the mid-'80s. And that's 19,000. And it's a walk in the park up a volcano, a little bit easier walk until the very end than Shasta is. But it's the altitude, which we'll talk about later, which is the challenge. Yep. Okay, so this is a shot of uh, my sailing crew. The Benino sign is the name of my sailboat, San Francisco Bay. It's a NAR, 30 foot NAR. And uh, next to me is Peter McGuire, a Yacht Club member, now living in Florida. And the other fellow on my left, uh, Mark Dom, who is uh, a boat partner of mine and a member of the St. Francis Yacht Club as well. And you can see the St. Francis Yacht Club Burgee prominently displayed at our Mid-Mountain Camp. That's probably at <laughs> Helen Lake. I think that's where we are, which is about a 10,000 foot stop where we spent the night. And the and tent is on the way. The, the Burgee is upside down, Terry. Yeah, the stars of the Burgee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't put it up, McGuire did. <laughs> okay. Okay. Paul. Uh, well, I, this is an overview of, of the routes. Uh, the middle of the screen there is the top of the mountain. And the major point of this slide is just that you can go up the mountain from any side. Uh, there are a number of glaciers at the top. And uh, the, the other routes tend to be the tougher routes. And uh, the rangers are the ones who, in advance, will tell you what's open, what's reasonable, what's not reasonable, and you have to get a permit from them. And so those orange wiggly lines, those are routes up the mountain. Is that what you're saying, Paul? Yes. It looks like a star with lines coming out and because all, all roads reach to the summit. But yes. And if you look down to the very lower left of the screen, that's Bunny Flat. That's where you can drive up to at 7,300 feet. And then the blue line goes to a series of switchbacks. That road is uh, open in the summer, and that goes to the old ski area, which is now closed. But Bunny Flat, and then that, that the red line that is kind of going up at uh, yeah. a seven o'clock angle is the Avalanche Gulch route, which I'll show in this slide much better. Uh, and I'll, although our photos may be overlying it here, if you look to the right of the screen, you'll see AG, that's Avalanche Gulch. And right underneath Ron's head is a slight flat area, which is called Helen Lake, uh, which is the usual campground for those who take the Avalanche Gulch route, which is the only route I've taken. So Laura, you've gone up this mountain. What's your record time now? 2.13. Two hours and 13 minutes. Terry and Paul, how long did it take for you guys to get up there? Well, <clears throat> from where Lori started horse camp, uh, I think I'll add another 10 hours <laughs> to get to the summit. <laughs> Keep in so, mind though, Terry, you were probably carrying a pack and yada yada. When I did it, I had perfect conditions. I could go super light. And I knew I had a very small window because it was cold and windy. But yeah, normally when people are climbing, it takes a lot longer because they're pacing themselves slow and steady. And also I was very acclimated. What, how much yeah, did you, well, you carry? It was still a Lori? tremendous yeah. accomplishment, Lori. So <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> how much were you carrying with you, Lori, when you went up? Barely anything. I had um, a windbreaker, water, a snack, my ice axe, crampons I got at uh, Helen, and um, a hat, and some gloves. 
And Terry <laughs> Anderlini, how much were you carrying when you went up? Well, we packed about 50, I packed about 50 pounds up to Helen Lake, which is the 10,000 uh, foot uh, overnight campsite. Yeah. And then from Helen Lake to the 14,178 uh, foot point, the, the summit, I carried about 15 pounds, which yeah. was, you know, jackets and food and water. Actually, you carry three liters of water, which is three liters of water is heavy. <laughs> yeah. And you do drink three liters of water every day when you're climbing up there. And you can also lose 20,000 calories uh, in your two or three day uh, adventure. Yep. yep. Lori, how much calories did you burn through? Oh, I don't know, maybe about six. My body was pretty used to um, that activity because I was working for Shasta Mountain Guides. So I was climbing a bit, taking groups up. Um, and in a speed ascent like that too, you're only out there for a short period of time. When folks go up to do a two day climb, they're out in the elements for 48 hours or more and dealing with you know, setting up camps and all that goes with that. It's a, it's a big expenditure of energy. And the one thing I've learned about climbing is too, it's not so much about the food as it is about staying hydrated. We can actually go for quite a while without much to eat, but we, you have to stay hydrated. So oh, I was way more worried about water than food. And so if I got burned through 6,000 calories, fine, I could have pizza that night. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, Paul. We're talking about preparation here. So that's, uh, this is appropriate. And the summer, summarizing what Lori and Terry just said, you got to be in shape. You got to know what the conditions are. You got to know what you can carry. Uh, you have to rent or buy equipment and put it to the test early, particularly your footwear. Yeah. Make sure you can wear it around for a day or two without getting blisters. Uh, you have to know when your no-go decision is going to be. How are we going to stop and not be stupid? Yeah. And then you have to acclimate. Uh, and, you know, like on a year like this year where it's very hot up there, I think uh, the snow is melting and you got to worry about falling rocks. And uh, be concerned about stuff you're not uh, usually doing. Yeah. Here's here, uh, here's a photo of Regan, Terry's wonderful climbing companion and wife. And Terry, why don't you run through the rest of this? A quick summary. Yeah, well, the night before we lay out all the gear out, and we check it out, make sure everybody's got what they need to get up there and have a good time. Uh, it's very important because there's no stores at 10,000 feet. So you better have everything in order. And one of my buddies there who was a Yacht Club member, was a Yacht Club member, Bernard O'Driscoll, uh, came on one of these climbs, and um, as we're going through the checkout of all his equipment, we got to the tent, and he said, oh, the tent's fine. I got it from a buddy, and I'm sure we don't have to even look at it or set it up, but I said, oh, come on, come on, let's set it up. Well, sure enough, we got to Helen Lake, and we started setting up his tent in 30 or 40 mile an hour winds, and one of the tent poles was missing. So all night long, his tent was flapping in the breeze, and he never got any good sleep, and that paid, uh, that gave him another problem because at the end of the day, Bernard tried very hard to get to the summit. But when he got to fifth, uh, about 500 feet before the summit, he had to give it up for other reasons, like he didn't bring enough warm clothes and basically didn't follow the checklist that Paul's got up here on the screen. You really need to follow your checklist. And uh, unfortunately, Bernard, although they had a great time, did not quite get to the top that day. And at the very bottom, Terry reminded me, you have to take out your, your poop bag. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. yes. One of the pleasures of climbing Mount Shasta is a, a pack-out bag. And do you have the target, Paul, that we show them? Oh, you know, I, uh, I carefully yeah. packed it away, but yeah. One of the more exciting things that you're going to experience is when you figure out what to do with this uh, pack-out bag. Uh, you look at this target and say, well, what in the world do we do with that? Well, that's what you're aiming at when you have to go number two up on the mountain. Okay, <laughs> enough said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul. Yes. Uh, okay, this is my slide. Uh, altitude acclimatization. This is the academic side. Terry knows the, I mean, uh, Lori knows the real side of this. But your blood chemistry actually changes when you go uh, up at altitude so that you release oxygen to your cells at lower partial pressures. And it takes days to fully adjust. Uh, and uh, that's why you have to be up at altitude before you start your trip. 
And you can take this drug Diamox that alkalinizes the urine a little bit and partially corrects for your over breathing. But um, uh, there's no substitute for just getting up there early. Terry's house is at 4,000 feet, so it's a good place to stay the night before you leave. Yeah. Uh, and the symptoms of altitude sickness are, you know, lightheadedness, fatigue, confusion, et cetera. And there really is only one treatment, and that's to go down. Uh, so that's a big challenge on Everest. I'm sure Lori can tell us a lot about it. But uh, it's, it's uh, not so much at 14,000 feet if you uh, sleep a night or two at a reasonable altitude first. Yeah. Yeah. On Everest, if somebody starts to have altitude sickness, we just get them down as fast as we can. Um, you just don't mess around with it up there. But Lori, what you're saying is the only real remedy is to come down, down the mountain. Once somebody's quite sick. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You get pulmonary edema from it. You can froth at the mouth yeah. and, and you just have to increase the pressure. And I, uh, they, uh, they probably have some pressure suits and things that they can do yep. up there now. We uh, have gamma. We had gamma bags. The whole thing, but but ultimately, if somebody's up at a higher camp and they're exhibiting um, altitude sickness, we get them down, and and then the whole medical uh, protocol would come into play. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, above Shasta level. Okay, Terry, take yeah. <laughs> no gamma bags on Shasta. <laughs> What's a gamma bag? It's a bag that you put people in when they're experiencing um, altitude related concerns and it helps with the pressure. It can be a lifesaver. Okay, so it's a pressurized bag into which you put a uh, otherwise sick person and- Yes. And, and, that and I've actually never had to use one. I've actually never even seen one being used, but I know we, we definitely had one as did all the camps and our doctor, would have supervised and our um, expedition advisor would have supervised all of that if it had needed to be used. Okay, on this slide, uh, we're talking about liftoff. And uh, I think for Bay Area people, a two day climb or even a three day climb is the way to go. One day climb, I would not recommend for Bay Area people because again, you can get mountain sickness up there. Plus you don't enjoy it as much if you can't just uh, enjoy the journey. If you're racing up and racing back, uh, as but locals sometimes do that and enjoy it, but I think Bay Area people are better off with a two or three day climb. Anyway, you start off early at, I'd say 9 a.m., 10 maybe even a little late, because you've got to pack a lot of stuff. If you're carrying 50 pounds or 30 to 50 pounds, you got to get it up to 10,000 feet. You're starting at 7,000 feet, so you got a 3,000 foot elevation gain. And, um, and off you go um, with your group, usually a group of three, four, or five max. Uh, these small groups are way to, to safely get up there. Uh, part of the uh, title of this, uh, uh, this talk was navigating um, up Mount Shasta and using your, your skills from navigation in the ocean. Well, some of the things we do there at Mount Shasta include what you might've learned uh, sailing. With, for instance, we set a course from one point to another, um, a monument, so that we don't, and we use compasses and uh, GPS and things of that sort, so we know what direction we're going in, and we wanna to get to one monument, a one fixed place on your topo map, and then from there we go to the next fixed place on your topo map. And the reason we do that is because it's not always a beautiful day. You could have fog up there. You could be walking in the dark. We start these climbs at you know three or four o'clock in the morning sometimes. And it's pitch black with no moon. And you got to know where you're going. You pull out your compass and you better get to uh, a known uh, checkpoint or waypoint before you go to the next one. Otherwise, you can get lost up there and fall off at, at the end of the mountain. You could slide down a crevasse or slide down a glacier. And so it's very important that you know where you are at all times on the mountain. Just like it's important when you're out at sea, you, you should know where you are in the ocean. Uh, checking with your waypoints and, and how far you're traveling uh, to find your next waypoint. So you just don't take off and start running for the top. You take off and go for one waypoint. Maybe it's a half a mile away or even shorter, quarter mile away. You find that waypoint before you go to the next waypoint, and that's how you get up to the top of this mountain safely. Otherwise, you can get lost up there, and, and people do die up there at once a year, uh, one or two people die, and a lot of the reasons they die is because they don't know where they're going, and they walk off the wrong end of the mountain, and there's danger up there. One other fun thing, when Eric Gray and I were walking up the snowfields together, 
we were with two sailors. Uh, he was a pincher and would go uh, at uh, steeper switchbacks. And I was the footer and I would just take longer switchbacks. And uh, we came out about even at the top, but it was a real tactical battle we had on the way up the mountain there. Pinching means you're going at a higher angle up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, he's going shorter, shorter steps, higher angle, going steeper steps. I was going flatter steps. I'd like to draw Laurie into this conversation because there's actual technical uh, terms for these different ways of, of climbing. You know, there's the, uh, the French way and the, and the duck way and the this way and that way and the step over way. And what, what do you, can you tell us about the various ways you're familiar with on, on actually yeah, sure. how to step up a mountain? Yeah, traversing, um, you're right. You can traverse high angle, you can traverse low angle. A lot of climbers like to use the French step, which is a, a technique that allows you to rest a little bit in between your stepping if you're traversing. And the duck walk is um, used if people want to go like straight up something. It's um, pretty taxing, but it can work well like through the red banks, for example. Um, so when I climb a mountain like Shasta, I would probably use the French step for the most part. And then at a real steep short section, I might use the, the duck walking. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons why you don't want to jump into this without a guide or somebody experienced that's made this trip and knows these various steps. Because if you don't know these various mountain, mountain climbing steps, you will be exhausted before you know it. Yeah. Uh, because these steps do save your muscles. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you need to save your muscles as you're hydrating. Otherwise, you'll never get to the top. So the first time, you better have a guide or somebody knows what they're doing to train you in these things. Uh, and there's also training to get back down the mountain. You know, it's not just about getting up to the mountain, because if you get up to the top of the mountain and you're exhausted, trying to get back down is probably uh, much more difficult because you're going to get hurt. You're going to yeah. try to get down too fast. You're going to stumble. And most of these injuries on Mount Shasta, at least, are on the return trip, not yep. going up. Right, Lori? Yep. And that's common on any mountain I've ever climbed. It's, um, it, it can be very difficult to get to the top but most people have problems and most fatalities happen on the descent. Why is that? Why is people that? Are, people are tired. They're dehydrated, they're tired, they're not thinking clearly. And on a mountain like Shasta, perhaps they don't know how to properly glissade, so then they get going too fast. Um, if they wait too long in the day, there's rock fall. So there's definitely um, a strategy for climbing a mountain like Shasta and it involves early hours when it's safer knowing how to glissade if it's too hard and icy you don't want to be going a thousand miles an hour down the glissade track so um knowing those things ahead of time will keep you safe what's a rock fall you said rock fall yeah there's um rock fall on chasta when it gets too warm it's rocks that will come from the top and um, they kill people so like an avalanche you mean not really an avalanche but it's just rock that will come down Sometimes climbers kick it down on accident, going through the red banks. And sometimes it's just frozen rock that starts to thaw and it comes down. And again, there's techniques for avoiding the rock fall. It's a, it's a call out and everybody's poised and ready to move if need be. Um, that's a, usually an after, uh, early afternoon event, but um, rock fall can happen anytime. And when you climb. went up in two hours and 13 minutes, and we should all just pause and say, holy cow, yes, that's the record. How long did you take to come down? I can get down pretty quickly. Um, I probably got down in about, and, and to the parking lot, I'm guessing in two and a half, three hours. So two, two hours, 13 minutes up. In two and a half hours down, is that what you're saying? Probably. I had really great glissade conditions. They were about perfect. And we timed it that way on purpose. Um, so I could glissade the whole way down and it was safe. It wasn't icy. And I think I was able to glissade almost to the hut. Close. For those for let, the non mountain climbers. Let, Ron, let me. Yeah, uh, super fun. Let's ask uh, let me run through a few uh, photos here that'll help uh, show this, I think. Paul, is that the first night? Yeah, this is the first night. You only, there's only one night on the mountain, and then you get up before, before dawn to do your, your summit attempt. Okay. Uh, and uh, you put rocks in your, in your tent so it doesn't blow away. And then you, this is what we're talking about on the summit day, you uh, 
you know, you carry less weight, but you're slow and steady and you make it up. I, I would just add that everybody rents an ice axe, which is important for glissading. But I found ski poles incredibly important because they kept me from getting blown over. When you get a gust of wind up there uh, and you're taking a step and you're on the edge of something, it's real nice to have another, uh, another anchor to the ground. What's uh, the breeze? What was the breeze like, Paul? How much weight? Uh, 40, you know, the puffs might be 40 in a, in a, you know, 15 knot day. And then you'll just get these puffs that just come rolling through. Uh, and then this is again, looking, we were talking about uh, how to switch back up. You're going up in icy conditions with crampons. Uh, I think this is uh, above Red Banks, but I'm not sure. Uh, Terry, this is your your picture with your friend Bernard, who didn't make it. Yeah, this is Bernard, and he was uh, sort of smiling. And uh, this is before he had to quit, and uh, very relaxed. I think we're at Helen Lake there, and I was congratulating him for getting there so fast. Actually, what I I told him was, this, this is his first try: is slow down and maintain a good pace. Don't try to keep up with the faster climbers, because we had a group of about six or seven people and he was trying to keep up with the faster climbers. Uh, that was a mistake because he wore himself out trying to get to mid mountain and then the next day he wore himself out again trying to keep up with them even though we're telling him slow down buddy. But uh, he really enjoyed it and, and he wanted to come back but if things just didn't work out for him make another trip. Yeah. But he really uh, he was in shape he gave it his best. It was fun. Yeah. We talked about Red Banks. I don't have a photo of it. That's sort of the steepest narrow area between various rock pillars. And then the, on the upper right of this photo is the summit. So everybody on this beautiful day knows they're going to make it. What's the altitude as you're looking up, Paul? 13.6, uh, 13.7. What, that's 500 feet from the top? Something like that. Okay. Yeah. And then here's the last 100 feet with Terry and Regan and ski poles. Somebody got there ahead of them to take their picture. And uh, I don't know, Terry, what were you thinking when you got up there with Regan? Well, I was thinking, uh, fantastic experience. Uh, here we are at the top of this mountain, and now let's just enjoy the awesome uh, view that you have there. You can see almost 100 miles uh, all around 360 um, and uh, enjoy it. Plus, one thing I experienced climbing up there is the air is so pure because of all the snow uh, and the high altitude air is something you don't experience at ground level. It's a new form of energy uh, mm -hmm. that I've never experienced before. I'm sure Lordy has. But uh, I thought, geez, I'm up here. I'm connected with nature. This is really getting into the soul of nature on Earth. Uh, what an awesome experience. So it's almost uh, uh, spiritual in a way to be up there and thinking about how how important that mountain is and all the mountains in, in the world and uh, how insignificant we are in the scheme of things. And the power and awesomeness of nature really struck me. Uh, in this trip, it's more about the journey than the destination. But when we got here, I was enjoying just the accomplishment. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, self-satisfaction saying you made it. But uh, really, the, the way to go is to really enjoy the mountain as you climb up there and really appreciate the power and beauty of nature. How many times have you summited, Terry? I've summited 11 times. I've failed five times uh, for various uh, reasons, but the failures, uh, some of them had to do with lack of conditioning. Some had to do with injuries. When, when people get hurt, you got to come back. Some of them had to do with weather. We got all the way to 13,000 feet one time, and it was blowing 60 miles an hour, and we didn't want to try to cross the ridge up there and get blown off down down into a, um, a glacier. So there's there's condition, weather conditions can stop you too. In fact, at the, uh, the mid-mountain camp, at horse camp, there's a saying by John Muir, getting to the top of Mount Shasta is optional, returning is mandatory. <laughs> so you don't, you don't get there, go up there thinking you're gonna climb the mountain every time you plan it and you got a date and you've got a plan and you get there and the weather is just so bad you cannot do it. And so you say, okay, uh, the mountain winds, we're gonna go home and try it next week or next month. And you don't force these things, just like sailors. When sailors see the weather conditions out in the ocean, you stay in port. 
the fellows that the sailors that go out there and try to get to another destination on a schedule, they usually uh, don't make it. And there's bad things that can happen out in the ocean. Well, bad things can happen on the mountain too. What do you think, Lori? Absolutely. I think Mother Nature is in charge out there, and it's our job to listen to what she has to say. So sometimes it's a go, and sometimes it's not a go, and um, I've seen some pretty tragic things happen when people decided that they were going to do it their way. So, Terry, what time do you leave on the ascent day, that is to say the second day, and what time do you leave camp, and about what time do you get to the summit? Uh, well... I, I like to get my team up at two or three o'clock in the morning. Now that seems kind of ridiculous, but you know, you've got to eat breakfast and then you've got to put on all, uh, all this gear in darkness. You got to put on your crampons. You got to get your helmet. You got to get your clothes on. You got to do this. You got to do that. And amazingly enough, it takes just about an hour to gear up. I almost felt like I was an astronaut trying to get into a capsule. Uh, well, for rookies, I mean, I'm sure Lori could get geared up in, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, but these uh, us land lovers here, uh, it takes a long while to get all this gear on and make it fit. And then, uh, and then put your helmet light on your hat because you're walking in the darkness. So you've got these uh, minor lamps uh, on your head and uh, off you, you go. So hopefully you're on the trail by four or five in the morning because you want to get to the summit by noontime. And Lori will explain as a guide it's very important that you get there by noontime because you want to come back in the afternoon uh, when the conditions are right so you can glissade and avoid rockfall. Rockfall is a huge danger up there. Uh, I've actually had one of my climber friends got hit by a rock on the return and he ended up in the hospital and almost lost his leg uh, because he took it right in the calf. Um, and you know, it was dangerous. And, you know, climbing up, like Lori said, you can yell out rock fall when you see rocks coming down at you as you're climbing up. The problem is when you're going back down and the rocks come down, you're facing downhill so you don't see them coming behind you. And one of the safety techniques we've deployed is we take one of our uh, climbers and put them down 50 yards looking up while the other four or five climb down to him or her so that that one person looking up can yell rockfall because the sound, you can't hear it, it's coming behind you. It's like a train coming at you. You don't hear it and you don't see it when we're going back down the hill. So the only way I know about being safe coming back in a rockfall time is to have an observer down the hill watching up and then the four or five come down and then you switch off the observer's change, change position and and we get down that way in a sort of a rotating chain. Uh, that's what we do. I don't know what Lori does, but that's what we did. What size what? rocks do you see coming down? Well, you can see anything the size of a, of, a, of a Volkswagen or the size of a pedal. The Volkswagens will kill you. Uh, and those are huge, of course, huge rocks that weigh, you know, could weigh a couple of hundred pounds or more. Um, and then you can have a 10 pound rock, which is the one that hit my buddy. Uh, and it put him in the hospital. I mean, it almost broke his leg. It damaged his blood vessels in his calf. Um, we had to pull him down, the, you know, let him lift, or we helped him down the mountain and took him to the hospital. And then they had to give him blood thinners, and then they had to take him to Reading to make sure he didn't lose his leg. I don't care if it's 10 pounds or 200 pounds will kill you. 10 pounds will hurt you. Five pounds will hurt you. And maybe two pounds will hurt you. Let me run through a few photos here. Okay, I made it to the top. This is the view. Uh, and, and you can see the shadow in front here. So it's still relatively early in the morning. You can see the shadow in the bottom of the screen. What time is it? Uh, well, just guessing by the shadow there, it's uh, well before noon. That's Black Butte in front of us to the west and then uh, the eddies beyond that. Now we're looking down the hill uh, at the glissading conditions. Uh, we, we alluded to that earlier. All I said here is down is definitely faster than up. And that path you see is uh, the path made by people's butts sliding down the mountain. Hey, Paul, yeah, explain how, what is, what is glissading? Explain the simple, the simple term. Uh, that's what I threw this definition in for. Basically, oh. it's sliding down the mountain <clears throat> on your butt uh, as it says here, like you're on skis or a toboggan, 
but you can get going too fast and that's why you have your ice axe. You roll over and dig it in as these pictures show. And if you also get going too fast and you catch a heel, that'll jam your boot right up into your butt, hyperflex your knee, and you won't be very happy that way either. So keep your feet up, slide on your butt, and be ready to roll. Uh, but it sure beats walking. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lori, you may want to add to that description. No, you got it. <laughs> All I would say is that on a mountain like Shasta, you can't always glissade. So sometimes if it's too hard, you're going to have to down climb. But glissading yeah. is a blast. Yeah, and of course, you don't hold your ice axe like that, do you, Lori? <laughs> what do you do I with your hold ice axe? It kind of in. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only photo I had. He was clearly getting ready to roll, I think. <laughs> what do you do with your ice yeah. axe? You don't have it high like that, is what you're saying, Lori. What do you do with it? Um, you have it close into your body so that if you need to roll, the tip of the, the axe will go right into the snow and stop you from going any further. So you just kind of hold it in, and then you use the, the um, pointed part of the ice axe as a little, like a break, kind of, in case you get going too fast. So you kind of use it as a, it's a great tool up there to control speed as well. And this is what it's like when you finally get to the bottom. <laughs> There's Eric Bray, uh, Paul Heineken, and myself. Uh, kind of exhausted, but happy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that last uh, hike down from horse camp to, the, uh, to Bunny Flat was really no fun at all. But fortunately, we left at least two beers in the car. I don't know what Eric's doing with a bottle of water there. <laughs> Lori, you've gone to the top of Shasta how many times? You know, I think it was it's somewhere between 30 and 40. And the reason so so much is I was a, a guide for, I think, three, three plus seasons. So a lot of the climbing I did was with um, clients. Mm -hmm. And on a personal note, I probably only climbed it myself, I don't know, four or five times, just doing my own climbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what age were you when you started climbing? I was, I picked it up later in my um, athletic career. I was about 37, 36 when I started climbing. Were you, as a high school kid... Were you athletic? Were you a runner? Were you a distance runner? What was your game like then? Yes, I was a distance runner. Mm -hmm. Yep. How old were you the first time you did any kind of mountain climbing? 30 years of age, that was it the first time? Oh, I think the first time I climbed anything, it was Shasta, and I think I was um, 36. Terry, you have this beautiful place up there. I've been pleased to be your guest, and what caused you to want to build a house on, or not build a, have a house on the, that beautiful site? Talk to us about how that started. Uh, well, it was sort of uh, fortuitous. My uncle and my father were fishermen, so they liked to go trout fishing up at, in the region of Mount Shasta. They went trout fishing in a place called Dunsmere, which is about 15 miles south of Mount Shasta, uh, Mount Shasta City. And so when I went up there to visit my old stomping grounds, because my dad dragged me up there when he was on his fishing trips, uh, me and my cousins, uh, later on in my life, I decided to go up there and look at my old haunts. And driving around with Regan, we decided to go up a little bit higher than Dunsmere, because Dunsmere is in a little valley below Shasta. And we noticed uh, that it's really nicer to be up by the mountain at 4,000 feet, where the city of Mount Shasta is. And so... I realized that I really wanted a house up here because a lot more sun, the great elevations, the great views of various mountains, not just Mount Shasta, but you see Mount Eddy, and you see Black Butte, and you've got uh, this beautiful air up there, this uh, snow refreshed air, and the environment is spectacular. Uh, beautiful trees, beautiful uh, meadows, and uh, a lot of sunlight. And so I felt it was really a special magical place, and that's why I wanted to end up there at least with a summer home and so the first thing i did was we bought a, just a, a summer home up there and then uh, after having the summer home up there for about 10 years we decided to build and so i bought a lot and we built this house you're talking about the the one at four thousand feet which is a custom-made house and it's a great place and by the way 
Paul Heineken owns a lot next door. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. We look forward to him being a neighbor someday with a house on his lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Uh, we, we've been fortunate to have neighbors that uh, put us up, so we haven't had to build. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Gary, I just got my season ski pass for the ski area this year, so you're going to be seeing more of us. Fantastic. You got a room. I put your name on it. You got your room. <laughs> you and your wife, uh, Jan, you will be seeing you. So I, now people can get hurt on these mountains. Uh, tell me, Lori, tell us a scary moment in mountain climbing and tell us why it was scary. And you've been up to the top of uh, Denali in Alaska. You've been to Aconagua in Argentina, which is 24,000 feet. You've been to Everest. So tell us this, something scary in a mountain climbing expedition. Then I'm going to ask the same question of my other two buddies who uh, had less experiences, but I want to hear from them as well. Well, I, I, to address that, Ron, every mountain I've ever climbed, there's been more than one scary moment, defining sometimes. And I'll tell you one on Shasta. Uh, we were climbing with a group, and we were almost to Helen, and this storm electrical storm swooped in and we had to frantically get our folks down because it started to thunder and lightning and up there that is extremely dangerous and scary so that's a story on Shasta that was um it came it, everything worked out just fine but um yeah, yeah it was it was um the first time I've ever had that happen on a on so that what, mountain. What can happen with the lightning? Do you mean lightning? It can hit you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not only that, when you're holding metal, like a, a, an ice axe, et cetera, it's a conduit for the, the um, lightning. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's just a no-go. <laughs> yeah. Terry, scary moment. Okay, well, uh, I was glissading down West Face, which is another, not Avalanche, but the, the slot next to it. And I heard, it was a beautiful day, and I heard a lot of sounds of water, like a river or a creek. Uh, and I looked around, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't seeing any water. Well, what was happening is the snow was melting under the ice cap. Snow was melting under the ice cap, and there was a river under this ice cap that I was sliding on, Okay. With my ice axe, I somehow put too much weight on the, on the pointed end, and I ripped open the ice cap, and all of a sudden, water was gushing out on me like a fire hose, maybe going up 10 feet in the air. And I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. This is spectacular. I've got a waterfall going right here, and the water's coming out of the mountain, and I'm thinking, man, this is awesome. And my, my buddy, who was more experienced than me, says, get out of there quickly. I said, okay. I scrambled out, not understanding why. Well, what found out later that I could have gotten sucked under the ice cap and died wow. <laughs> because I opened it up. And if I'd sat there, the, the ice cast uh, ice part could have cracked and I could have just gone right into the river and never come back out. So it was a very wow. dangerous experience. But at the time I did not appreciate that danger. It's never happened to me before or since. Maybe Lori knows something more about it than I do, but it scared the hell out of me. I've never heard of that, but um, I totally could see how that could happen on the West route for sure. Paul, scary moment. Oh, not, nothing at that level. I, I would only add that things can happen very quickly. Yeah. A, fall, a fall and you're incapacitated and a falling rock, you're incapacitated. Uh, the snow crumbling on a, under a step that you thought was okay. Uh, so, I mean, my, uh, on Kilimanjaro, where we went up to 19,000 with, you know, without oxygen, uh, Janet was not thinking clearly. And it's like, you have that dilemma, dilemma of, uh, do you work that last few hundred feet to summit, or do you get smart and go down? And, uh, cause then going down takes seconds. You jump and slide down a cinder cone in seconds and you say, you know, what was, what was the problem? You know, then you're thinking clearly and everything's fine. So I, I think it's the, the, the rapidity of change is the major concern. Hey, Ron, yeah. I got one more. Got one more. Yeah. Uh, one more. So coming back from the summit, you know, I climbed on the backside 
uh, hot Lombolum Glacier. So I've been on all sides of this mountain. Yeah. Coming back, and I had a guide with me. Coming back, we were kind of tired. Uh, we're probably at 13,000 feet. There's a lot of rock and snow. Um, a rock, I, we're all roped up. The point of this is we're all roped up. And I lost my balance. I stepped on a rock and it moved. And then I put my other foot down and that rock moved. And before I know it, I was nose down going down a glacier. But I was roped up. And my team, they know how to self-arrest. They all dropped down on the snow and ice axed in. And that rope stopped me from going down a thousand feet and falling into a crevasse. Uh, and so it was a very scary moment for me. But the training and the expertise of my teammates saved my butt. <laughs> yep. Right, Lori? Those so absolutely. Happen. I've been in those situations, and it's, it's, you just don't mess around. <laughs> so, well, Ron, when you get to the higher altitudes, many times the guides will have yeah. us rope up. And then there's a rope between the climbers. If one guy falls, the other four save him. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's how it's done on Denali. Talk about size of size of, uh, of trips. How many people is a good is a good look, Lori? Uh, no more than six. Okay. Six is a big trip, and if you have six climbers, you should have two guides. Uh huh. One at the front and one at the back. What's a typical size you like? Three. Three. three four. Three. Uh huh. Yeah, small is good. So, Terry, navigating. How often are you looking at your compass, and or how are you navigating? Well, <clears throat> of course, conditions dictate. At night, you better look at your compass. Of course, we plot a course, I plot a course before I even start the climb so that I'll know that I have a bearing to my first monument or my first landmark. Uh, because at night, it's, uh, it's dark. You can't see where you're going. You gotta know where you're going and know how, how much distance you travel to get to that first, that first monument. And then, uh, uh, the second monument, and so you navigate up that way, uh, waypoint, so to speak. Coming back, I'll tell you one t bad story. Uh, well, we went up one day on the backside, and it was uh, foggy, but not so bad. It was enough to where you could see where you were going. Uh, the guy we were with did not uh, anticipate fog on the back on the return, so he didn't put down what they call wands, okay? Mm -hmm. Wands are little, little uh, flags on sticks that if you're wondering about how to get back, you post them every, I don't know, 300 yards or something. So you can follow your little flags back to where you started, which is important. In any event, we went to the summit and we came back and on our way back, there were no wands because we didn't put them down. And uh, we're coming back at about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. It was totally foggy, just like bay fog. You know, you can't see more than, you know, 10 yards in front of you. And we couldn't find our camp. We wandered around for an hour and a half in the dark and in the fog, unable to find a yellow tent, yeah. bright yellow tent. We could not find it. We sent people to the left and to the right and everything. And I thought we were never going to find it. And I thought we we're going to have to abandon the whole thing and go to the car because we're freezing cold, tired, and grumpy. And you can get lost up there <laughs> if you don't know where you are. And, and we didn't. What, have you experienced that, Lauren? Yeah, I'm very familiar with the wanding um, technique. I haven't had that happen on Shasta, although we always carried wands because of what you're saying. Sometimes the low clouds will come in. It's not even fog. It's the lenticulars that come down. But other mountains I've climbed, we have needed to um, have the breadcrumb trail, if you will, for sure, so that you um, don't have a problem locating your tent. So Lori, help educate us. What is a lenticular, please? On Shasta, it gets this, it's a very unique kind of cloud formation. that's sort of flat and it looks like a flying saucer. And sometimes the lenticulars can come down as low as like Lake Helen. Usually they're just at the top, but sometimes that changes. And it's, it's a really unique kind of weather pattern. I've seen it on, I, there's other mountains that get that same thing, but it's not something you would see uh, like in Reading. <laughs> um, and, and, and Terry, you've seen the lenticulars because you're up there a lot, and Paul, you probably have too. They're really um, beautiful. 
And gentlemen, I'm so sorry, I need to go, but I want you all to carry on because this is very interesting. Um, yeah, and it's Lori, been an thank honor. Thank you very much for being our guest. Yeah. Lori Bagley holding the record of two hours and 13 minutes <laughs> of sending um, uh, Mount Shasta. And you did this in 2001. And uh, thanks for sharing your stories about uh, mountain climbing in general and yeah. uh, helping um, our buddies understand, you know, even more about this great game that uh, Terry's uh, begun introducing us to. So thanks very much, Lori Bagley. The champ. been an honor. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Lori. Thanks yes, so you guys too. I hope to hear from you all. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, Paul, talk about how tired you got on the trip. It reaches a steady state of fatigue, I think. It depends whether or not you're thinking about your overall fatigue or one particular joint. You tell the audience, so Paul is about 6'5", and yeah. you're, you're about 202, two, two, or how much do you weigh? Me? Yeah. 165. 165 and six foot five. Uh, yeah. Paul is very fit for uh, a, a being an adult. And uh, not only do you sire two world champions, but you're a great sailor yourself. And when you say you're kind of steady state tired, describe that to us. You're well, also a doctor. You know, I, you want to be climbing aerobically. So when I'm aerobic, my heart rate's at about 120 and I'm not breathing too hard and everything's okay. And if you push yourself anaerobic, your heart rate's 130 plus, and then you're really getting tired and your muscles are getting tired and they're working anaerobically. So you just want to be this slow but steady on the way up, uh, not, you know, not, you are breathing hard because the air is thin. And uh, the harder you breathe, the more lightheaded you get. In fact, when Terry was talking about his, uh, uh, reverential feelings at the top of the mountain, I was thinking he was hypoxic. Uh, 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 low brain oxygen. Uh, but, but, uh, We've but seen that, him like that before. Yeah. yeah. You should keep me that way. I'm, I'm, I'm much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you're coming down, you, uh, you know, you do pound. And, you know, I, an example, when I, I did half tone with my kids, uh, on my 60th birthday. And we got up to the top at the same time. And on the way down, they danced over the horizon. <laughs> and, and Jay and I were just, oh, are we ever going to get down? Our knees were aching. We we're delighted we had our poles. And all you're thinking the whole way down is about your sore joint, whichever one is the one that's screaming at the time. Uh, and so I, that's, you know, you just try to go up evenly. Take, take short rest. One thing we did in the hikes is uh, every half hour we would lie down and just pick up our legs with the idea that that's a way of clearing all the old venous blood out of your legs and then get up and go again. I don't know if it works, but it you was- You call it the venous blood. What's that mean, the venous blood? Just the, 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 slug, the, the return blood to your heart. Okay. Have, give, give, give it some help with gravity. Uh, <laughs> So, Terry, you and I have known each other for a long time, and we're born the same year. When you uh, think about going up the mountain, can you say to yourself, I'm not going to go up after I'm, after I'm a certain age? Or where, what's your attitude about how long you can keep doing such a beautiful, artsy, wonderful thing as climbing the mountain? I don't think it's age-driven. I think it's condition-driven. I mean, I'm, as long as I can get in condition to climb the mountain, I'll be climbing it. Uh, in fact, I think the somebody told me that the oldest guy to ever get up there was like 90 years old. So I got a few more years to go if I can make that uh, that mark. But uh, no, I think it's more of a conditioning thing. Um, stay healthy, you know, work out every day, eat the right food, as Paul knows. And as long as you can stay in condition, age is not an issue. Tell us a beautiful moment on the aisle, on on the mountain. The beautiful moment, well, there are many of them, of course, but one of them was uh, we were coming back on the backside. Uh, we were about 13,000 feet, and we stopped to have a little drink and a, a power bar. And all of a sudden, it was a beautiful day, all of a sudden, a flock of monarch butterflies came down on us and landed. They were in migration. There must have been a, a hundred of them, 
and they ended up, landed on all our gear. There were four or five of us. We're sitting there eating uh, a candy bar or a power bar and some water. They obviously got lifted up there on an up current on their migration, and they needed to plop down and take a break. So they plopped down on us. I guess we were targets or something. And they landed on us, and they were on our backpacks and on my shoulders and in my hands. I wish I had a camera to take a picture of this. But they just sat there, and we sat there looking at them, and they sat there looking at us. And then finally, we had to get going. I mean, they were not leaving. So we had to kind of brush them off ourselves, put them back on the snow, and we took off. It's never happened to me before or since. It was an amazing experience, another connection with nature. So, Paul, you and I have sailed together, and you're a great sailor, and you've had lots of fun adventures. Tell me something beautiful about going up one of these mountains. Um. Well, I, I think Kilimanjaro was the most special we ever did because that was a five-day trip. And, uh, and every day was different. At different altitudes, it was just completely different. Um, and, and, you know, you get up there before sunrise and you see the sunrise from you think you're on the top of the world. And, you know, you aren't thinking that clearly, but you're enjoying the moment. And... Uh, uh, it's that feeling of accomplishment, like, you know, and, and kind of knowing in that situation, it's very unlikely I'm going to do this again. This is a once in a lifetimer. So Terry, you are an ambassador to, uh, of the mountain to many folks at the, at the Yacht Club and a great ambassador for the club overall. Thank you very much for uh, inspiring uh, the trip and inviting our buddy Paul along. I will come up. Uh, this is, I wanted to beforehand, and I got to quit procrastinating and get off my duff and do it. All those watching the, this show can know that uh, this is a really, really, really uh, exhilarating thing to do. Other friends of ours whom you've heard about who've done it all come back with the same kind of tale about, that's a kind of spiritually cool thing to add to your uh, bucket list of stuff that you've done, as well as being uh, challenging. And thank you for warning us, Terry, about you know, the pitfalls you can have, if I pardon that pun, in going up a mountain, but it's a challenging kind of a thing. Paul, it's so cool of you to uh, come back and tell us all about your, uh, your adventure in this particular case. And uh, thanks so much for sharing your story with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, you can visualize me ringing the bell as I say, thank you so much. And that adjourns the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live for the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Ron.